talking about the power of humor with my guest, Mr. Trevor Noah. Of course, you know him as an author, a comedian, and the host of The Daily Show. Trevor, thanks for stopping by today. Thank you very much for having me. This is fun. We're live. This is the first Inbound Studio Facebook Live. This is the first live I've ever done in my life. I, I don't think that's true. That's not true. <laughs> but you can lie when you lie. He's good. He's good, this one. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the power of humor in your life. Um, growing up in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, in the 80s, doesn't seem to be the most hysterical setting and time and place in history. It depends on who you were. I, I suppose. <laughs> Some people were like, this is a good time. Well, tell me, was, uh, was humor immediately a way of coping with what you were dealing with as a kid? You know, growing up, I found uh, in my family, we used humor to cope. You know, humor is a tool that you can use to process information. It's a, it's a filter that you see the world through. And so it doesn't minimize what's happening to you. It doesn't minimize how you feel about what's happening, but it helps you cope with the information that's coming in. And, and so that's how we've always used humor in my home. Can you give a specific example growing up of when you kind of relied on humor to get you through a, a tough time? Oh, wow. Oh, there's tons of times. I'm trying to think of which time in particular. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I, I know growing up, I always, I always realized that humor was a tool I could use. I mean, whether it was getting away from bullies, whether it was, you know, making my mom laugh so that she wouldn't beat me whether it was, uh, basically it was always to avoid being done grievous bodily harm. That's, <laughs> right. that's, that's what you use humor for. Yeah. You go like, you, you know, what do they say? A, a laughing jury is not a hanging jury? Right. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, my life was punctuated by, by comedy, but trying to think back to one moment is, 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 is difficult. I do know there was one moment, I was, so I was um, seven or six years old and um, I, was, I, went to, I was sent to the principal's office because I was being naughty with a friend, and I went to a Catholic school originally, and um, the principal was going to give us a spanking, mm. and he brought out like a little rubber piece of, I don't know what it was, and my friend and I had to bend over, and then he proceeded to spank us, which was very formal. I'd never been spanked before, because when you grow up in an African family, you get beaten, you don't get spanked. <laughs> right. Skip right to that. Yeah, so like spank, it was like very formal, very like, you know, like on the bum, count them down, <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. And then I, I did the countdown while he was doing it, because he did my friend first. It's like five spanks, and he went five, four. <laughs> and so when he came to me, then I was like five, four, three. <laughs> and then my friend laughed, and then I laughed, and then the guy was like, it's not funny, it's not funny. And then he was just, and I was like, and then he didn't, he just couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> he must have thought I was like a creep. I was right. like, he's enjoying it. <laughs> and Sadomasochistic. You, yeah, if you enjoy it, then it's and not You're taking the fun out for this poor guy that just wanted to hurt you. Exactly. Think of him, Trevor. That's, I, I felt bad. <laughs> did your, uh, where did your sense of humor come from in terms of your family? Did your, do you have a similar sensibility <sighs> from your mom? Oh yeah, definitely. My sense of humor came from my mom. My sense of humor came from my granddad. They were the funniest people in my family, by far. My granddad was a, was a wild man, very boisterous, really charming man by the name of Temperance, Noah. And he used to walk around in our neighborhood in Soweto, in a place called Mediolands, where we grew up. And um, like he would walk around uttering random English phrases just because he knew most people that lived near him couldn't speak English. But he didn't know what they meant. He just knew how to say them. Right. You know, so like someone would greet him and then he'd be like, good afternoon, remember that today is a day that is not promised, but we must not forsake our future as we see fit. And I'd be like, what does that mean? He's like, it doesn't matter. It <laughs> but it sounds sounded good. good. Right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Um, I want to talk to you about the way you connect with audiences because when, as, a, as a host of a show like The Daily Show, you know, your background is primarily from stand-up and you have right. a, a, a few kind of masters to serve when you're hosting a show like that. You have to connect with the guest, you have to connect with the studio audience in the studio, and maybe most importantly you need to connect through that lens, Definitely. the audience yeah. at home. Is that, are there conflicts there? Is stand-up what's serving you well? Give me a sense of sort of where your head's at in terms of who are you trying to connect with when you're doing your show? I find it's, 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 it's trying to create a balance. So you're trying to be in a space where you're creating a show that essentially is for the home viewer, but what you're trying to do is bring the home viewer into the space where the show was made. Right. And so it's trying to communicate with somebody that's not there and yet at the same time they are. It's trying to almost do what you do on FaceTime or Skype with the family when one person is not, and you try and have a hangout. And using stand-up, I can communicate with my audience, but getting the message to the home viewers is, is the most important thing. And, and finding that balance is, 
is what makes it a, you know, a, a challenging format. Um, but what's great is stand-up is, is, is all about communicating. Yep. And then if you, if you build a relationship with the person at home and you can picture who they are, which I always try and do, then, um, then I find it's easy to communicate with, with people uh, you know, on both planes. I, I read an interview with you recently where you talked about, you said, quote, I'm not selling you anger. You were talking about wanting to create a connection with, with, with everybody, with your audience as we were talking. And I find it, I, I, it strikes me also like, you know, you interview people that, whose politics you don't agree with. Yes. You know, Tommy Lahren, et cetera. And like that interview got a lot of press. Is it important for you to kind of reach across to an audience that doesn't necessarily agree with you politically to find moments of connection? Well, not necessarily. You know, it, 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 it all depends. What you get out of an interview, you cannot determine at the beginning of an interview. Oftentimes, you go in, and when you come out on the other end, you find you, you've gotten something that you didn't anticipate. Sometimes I find bringing someone from the other side, uh, whatever it may be, whether it's the political spectrum or just from a world that you're not familiar with, is really bring somebody in to help you refine your point of view mm. or help you challenge yourself. Because if you spend too much time in your own world, you only know what you know and right. you believe it and you reinforce that. When you meet someone who doesn't agree with you, they force you to challenge your beliefs. And in the challenge comes the galvanizing of ideas, I find. And that's what I appreciate. That's why I'll engage with somebody I don't agree with. I don't think I'll change everyone I meet. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, persuade everyone I have a conversation with. It's making with. you sharper as much as it yeah, is. Yeah, but it's like know. it also pokes holes in my arguments where I walk away going, ah, okay, why do I believe that? Yeah. Why do I say that? Can I make that stronger? Can I go and read up or can I reinforce what I believe? Or is it a view that I have to now question um, as a whole because I've, I'm just parroting something that other people have said? Did your, did your job change the day after the U.S. election, you think? Did your, oh, yeah. How so? Well, I think, uh, you know, as, uh, as I would say with my friends, shit got real, <laughs> <laughs> essentially. Because before that, there was a general sense of, um, of arrogance, maybe, for many people watching the U.S. election. There was, a, there was a feeling of it's all a foregone conclusion. It almost felt like... It was just, you know, painting by numbers. Right. That's there was an inevitability was. to what was going to happen. Yes, just... the joy of the race, mm -hmm. but the truth is we know how it's going to end. It's inevitable. And after Donald Trump won, you could feel a shift in how people perceived politics. You could feel a shift in how people perceived the future of the United States and even the world. And at that point, I realized for myself, now there was a purpose not just for myself, but for the show, to inhibit a space where we would be examining, probing, and questioning the world that we were now living in. You know, so some people go, oh, you seem like you got a lot more